officially shifted sort of from one day to the next in very dramatic fashion. We actually had a very hot start to September here in Copenhagen. It was really warm. It was really muggy. If you look at the actual temperatures, they're going to be lower, but the weather, like warm weather, like mid 20s seems to feel really, really hot, like mid and high 20s feel really, really hot in Copenhagen. And I don't know if it's because of the humidity or if it's because we're just not used to it anymore. And I actually said like it was like a Sunday I was teaching. I told some of my regulars that I was like almost wishing for the Danish fall weather to start. And of course, that came back to bite me. Uh, the next day, like Monday, it was a dramatic shift. It was officially fall, it was dark, it was dreary, it was rainy. And so even though it is sunny right now when I am filming, it definitely feels like fall. There is a crisp chill to the air when I do the walks in the morning. They are much cooler with the dog. I actually had to like put her in her little sweater this morning when we went outside. Not that it's like super cold, but she's fairly delicate. <laughs> so anyway, all this to say, it is fall. I'm feeling the cozy vibes. It is like the onslaught now from like now until the end of March, maybe into April, where weather is just gonna be awful in Denmark, but I've decided this year to be like, you know what? I gotta be outside, I'm gonna get the right gear. I have maybe not had the best gear the last couple of years. I'm just going to embrace it. It is a really, even though it's dreary, it is also a really nice, like cozy, lead up into Christmas. Not to say that Christmas is anytime soon yet, um, but it can be kind of cozy with this weather in Denmark. So we're already a solid chunk into September and I have finished two things and I'm well on my way to finishing a third. So the first thing that I finished was I finally finished the Pomegranate Gate by Ariel Kaplan. I don't know why. I think there was some expectation difference between what I thought the book was about and what I got. And maybe that is because I read the synopsis like a year and a half ago when I found this book physically and like only one time and I don't really hear that many other people talking about it. So I feel like I had like a memory of what I thought the book was about from so long ago and I didn't reread the synopsis at any point. So I'm going to share the synopsis or at least like parts of the synopsis with you so that I don't give you a mistaken impression of what this book is about. It is a lyrical, first lyrical installment of the Mirror Realm Cycle, a vibrant and heartfelt Inquisition era Jewish epic fantasy in the vein of Naomi Novik, Catherine Arden, and Tasha Suri. One of our main characters, Toba, can speak but not shout. She can walk but not run. She can write with both hands in different languages but has not had a formal education. The only treasure Toba has dared to keep is a precious star sapphire set in a necklace she must never take off. And this is, of course, in Inquisition era time where they are told that they have to leave the Spanish fantasy version of Spain and they're not allowed to take any valuables with them. Naturally, sees things that aren't real and dreams things that are. He's a well-trained tailor, but a middling one, and he is risking his life to smuggle a strange family heirloom, a centuries-old book he must never read and must never lose. The Queen of Sepharad, or Sepharad, I'm not sure, has ordered all Jews to convert or be exiled with nothing. Toba, Naftali, and thousands of others are forced to flee their homes. Toba, accidentally separated from the caravan of refugees that are um, traveling to take a ship somewhere else, stumbles through a strange pomegranate go grove and crosses into the magical realm of the Mazix. And then uh, it goes into some elements here in the rest of it that I feel like were spoilery, so I'm not going to comment on them. Uh, I'm not going to say that, but like there are some, there, some things that I thought were a shock and that even were like twists that I wasn't in love with are actually like blatantly said in the synopsis. I would say that we spent the majority of our time there, which is maybe one element that I wished I had more time with Naftali and with the situation that he was going through, like um, I wish it was more even split. Overall, this wound up in a place that I'm actually relatively interested in. I think that it took some, it made some interesting choices towards the end that do make me want to pick up the next one. I think it is coming out later this year. I'll pop up the cover. Um, I'm pretty sure it's coming out this fall. I put it down in my new releases like to check out list because I am curious to see what happens next. 
because of the really unique choices. However, I found the tone of the book a little bit odd. Like there were some, there were some poignant moments in regards to Inquisition elements that definitely were was more what I was expecting the tone overall to be but then there was a little more like silliness especially with Toba's element there was like a bit of a montage in Toba's story where we were like trying to learn a thing and it's just a little bit get that part got a little bit repetitive for me and I feel like it made it feel longer than I think that that part actually was just because I was reading it slowly over a course of period of like over a period of time but after finishing it I had a little bit more time I think I said last month that I like I think that I thought I was going to be learning more about the Inquisition and I wasn't really seeing the mirrored, uh, the, the idea here is that the, this like magic realm and the mortal realm are mirrored and influence each other and I do see that now. I feel like at the time I wasn't catching on to something, like to catching on to a, a comparison. So I do see that now, especially upon reflection. I, I wish I was someone who was like, hmm, interesting, I'm going to go read a, a a non-fiction book about the Spanish Inquisition and that's just not me but I am going to maybe go and read a little bit more about the Spanish Inquisition Inquisition, so that I can understand more elements of what I read and maybe some like influences that I wasn't catching and then also like to maybe like put myself in a better place going into the second book. There was another POV character that was almost introduced or was almost on page so infrequently that I kind of forgot that they were POV character in between the times that they were. So I either wish that they weren't a POV character or that I had had more time with them to understand them a little bit better. It's not that I didn't feel for them in their situation, but yeah, I just like didn't build that connection with that character in the way that I wish that I had of. So I'm gonna leave it there. It was just like not the experience that I thought that I was getting and I don't know even what that means or why I feel that way. There were some descriptions like we relied on people's eye color to define them in if there was overlap and I that's not something that I always pay attention when characters are mentioned so then be, but then later on when it was too late it was almost like really relevant and I feel like I would have caught on who somebody was before that happened because I wasn't paying attention to the eye color so like that was like weirdly important so yeah I'm just it was an it was an odd experience for me i would definitely like to pick up the next book to see if it's actually not a right fit or if it was just like i didn't have the right idea going in i know i would almost reread this book again to to see if it flows a little bit more better in a smoother reading with with less less expectation ruining it i guess is, is what i'm trying to say Anyway, I'm not going to do a review on it because I feel like I've had such a weird reading uh, experience with it, which I was planning on reviewing it. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to wait until like if I ever do a reread or maybe if I read the second one as well, like I'm going to wait. I'm not going to review that. I am going to review though the second book that I finished and that was The Sky on Fire by Jen Lyons. This is the, I guess not the second book she's written, but it's the first thing that she's written or the Gen Lines has written outside of the A Course of Dragon series, which is definitely one of my favorite series of all time. I read that series a while back when it was like, as it was coming out and absolutely loved it. Enter a, I'm gonna share the synopsis with you. It is actually pretty short. So enter a world ruled by dragons. Anarod lives only for survival, preferring to thrive in the jungles of the deep with the Titan Drake she keeps by her side. When an adventuring party saves her from capture by the local warlord, Sicarian. She is eager to return to her solitary life, but this is no ordinary rescue. Anarod's past has caught up with her, and these cunning misfits intend to spirit her away to the cloud cities where they need her help to steal from a dragon's horde. There's only one in the cloud cities. Dragons. There's only one in the cloud cities. Dragon rule. Oh, that's a weird sentence. Okay, this is a weird sentence, but like, dragons rule this cloud cities and the horde in question belongs to the current regent, Neveranimus, Neveranimus, I'm forgetting how they said it in the audio audiobook, and she wants Anarod dead. Enjoy this page-turning adventure with conniving dragons, high-stakes intrigue, a daring heist, and a little bit of heat. So I will say like, over my, overall my feelings of this book are that there was a lot of potential, there was a lot of really interesting things that, that were done really well. Jen Lyons' world building is 
unlike anyone else's. And if you're looking for queer normative world building, you gotta check out Jen Lyons. It's worth it. I'm gonna do like a, a review for this book specifically, as, as I said. So I will like not say everything that I feel about it, maybe. Uh, and I'll wait for that one. I do have a should you read uh, for the course for a course of dragons as well as a review of the first book as well. Please bear in mind that my review of the Rowan of Kings is like the second video that I ever made. So like, go in there knowing that please and be gentle. But <laughs> But overall there was like something missing and I feel like the characters perhaps just like fell a little bit flat. There was something missing in this book though and I think that it's like characterization. So while the world building was really amazing, I think this is a really unique cool world and she and they and Jen Lyons does build <laughs> worlds where it feels like there's more there. There's more there. It's a it's a fully realized it's a fully realized unique world where you could get more stories <laughs> where you could get more stories within this world and I feel like it's almost maybe a detriment that this is a standalone like that Jen Lyons didn't have enough time to do everything that could have been done to make this story and the characters hit a little bit better like even if this was a duology I don't know where you would end it like uh, in terms of like where in the the arc of the story it could have been split but I just feel like there was enough t time to build these characters in a way that made you like really really care about them and therefore really really care about the situation. There were some unearned feelings to some of the relationship dynamics and I don't just necessarily mean the romantic ones but also excuse me <laughs> but also relationships like outside of the romantic ones I think there were some strong feelings that didn't necessarily have the time and, and um, proper development to ha to merit where we got with them. We do have your classic like ragtag group of misfits um, and that's one thing where I feel like with like found family groups of misfits that is tough in a standalone is that they don't all get enough time to be to really shine on their own um and so like you have the, you're like given like a promise that isn't fully realized there certain characters within this group are more prevalent and more like they pop um and feel a lot more real and fully like a three-dimensional than some of the other ones where you're like oh this mysterious person over here like he doesn't say much and you there's allusions to their backstory but not but that you don't get enough information i would say about them overall like i did enjoy it it just like it's missing something and i can understand why the goodreads rating is what it is because there is like that missing spark and element so that's what i have read so far i am currently reading dreams of fire which is a novella set in the gale song world come on up, by shauna lawless um in my you know build up to the land of the living and dead the land of the living and the land and the land of the dead land of the living and dead coming out this month and then next up, uh, I don't know, like there's a couple things that are coming up, but nothing on like at the library, but nothing that seems like really, really exciting and relevant other than Dreams of Sora, which is the other novella. This Dreams of Fire is like 0 0.5 in this world and Dreams of Sorrow is either 1.5 or 2.5. So that's the only thing uh, coming up in my holds at the library that feels like, yeah, I really want to pick that up next. I will probably get whatever next audiobook becomes available, which I'm pretty sure is going to be, hush, which I'm pretty sure is going to be God Killer by Hannah Kainer. Um, just because I don't have an audiobook right now, actually, that's not true. I took out Shadow of the Gods in like an attempt to reread and the audiobook is not working for me. So I'm probably not going to do that because it's hard to pay attention to it. Uh, and I need something that is really easy to listen to on audiobook. So if God Killer, that's the next audiobook that is coming up. So if that comes up soon, I will probably, I will definitely take it out. I have also taken out Iron Widow now that I think about it. I have taken out Iron Widow as an ebook from the library. So when I finish Dreams of Fire, I'll probably be picking up that. And if I get the act together and find out how to change my physical address on my Amazon account, then I will start reading some kindle unlimited books you guys i'm just like i don't have i don't have the time to sit down and like change my address on amazon which is just like ridiculous but there we are i think somebody needs to be taken outside so i'm gonna go do that and i'll see you in my next check -in.
update you on, four of which I think I read in the last three to four days. Um, two novellas, but mostly contemporary romance. So let me update you. I wrote it down so that I won't actually forget. Uh, the first thing that I finished was, after I checked in last, was Dreams of Fire. This is the 0.5 novella in the Gale Song series by Shauna Lawless. I am reading these in anticipation of the fact that The Land of the Living and the Dead has just come out as well. So I read Dreams of Fire, which is a novella from the perspective of Ronit, who is the sister of Fola, one of our perspective POV main characters in the main series. And this is a perspective from about a hundred years before the start of the first book when the two girls, the two sisters, are actually quite young, like in their 20s. So, and we're getting like a little bit of a backstory of, I guess just Ronit's impression of certain other characters who become very relevant in the series. It's not necessary to read this. It's more like if you would like more in this world, this is more in this world. The writing is very similar. However, I will say that I really miss the audiobook narrator. So with the two books that I've read in this series, I listened to the audiobooks and the novellas. The My library only had the ebook copies. So I was reading myself and I really, really risk, missed the Irish, <laughs> um, the Irish, Irish accent narrator uh, who just does such a fabulous job. So I, I did really notice that I was missing that when I was reading this. I also feel like it wasn't the backstory of Ronit that I thought I was going to be getting. It's how Ronit comes to learn a little bit more about her magic as well as a period of time that is um, leading up to a big change in how this society, um, how these people conduct themselves as in the right world but they have like certain rules that they follow in the main series on um, their like where they have to live and their integration with mortals and this is before those changes and decisions were made but it's sort of like the rumblings of change might be happening and you we get to see like sort of like what that looked like beforehand and we get to see Ronit's um, perspective for that and as well as again like the introduction to some other characters and a little a little a little taste of Ronit's pers pers uh, perspective there. So I enjoyed it, but it wasn't like my favorite thing ever in the world. It, it was a fine addition and it was short, so it wasn't like I lost a lot of time on something that I didn't absolutely love. It just like, yeah, I missed the narrator and it wasn't what I thought I was going to get out of Ronit. I don't know if that makes sense. Not a bad thing, just like, I thought it was going to be more dramatic, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, I finished that. That was an ebook. Then I have been slowly, slowly, painfully taking away at another ebook that I'm going to tell you in my currently reading because I'm still currently reading that. Um, but I have not been making a ton of progress and I've actually just like been in an audiobook mood. However, no books, no audiobooks are available at the library of like the ones that I have on hold. Like none of them have become available lately. So I just have nothing. I just got like, I had like no audiobooks to listen to. I read Love Light Farms by BK Borson, I think, maybe two Christmases ago, whenever it originally came out. And it is, this is a small town romance series where we followed, you know, different characters. It was fine. I totally like, I read it. I didn't really think much about it. I had like never really considered reading on, but I kept hearing people talk about business casual which just recently came out or came out this year and everyone is really loving it, loving it. And then I realized that it was the final, the fourth and final book in the Love Light series. And it has a setup that I would like to see done well, like done really well. And I read Not in Love by Allie Hazelwood, which has a similar setup and didn't love it. And that is the, like, we're just hooking up that it turns into something else. Uh, I really wanted to just check out Business Casual, but I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go back, read the other books. So I've next read, this is a really, really long prelude into saying, I next picked up In the Weeds, book two in the Love Light Farms series, the audiobook. I think I read it within a span of like 24, maybe 48 hours, not sure. This one was following Evelyn and Beckett. Beckett works on the Christmas tree farm and Evelyn was the social media star who was visiting the farm in the first book. And they had like had like a one night stand or like a two night stand. 
a few months prior and then meet again at the farms and they're like but she had like left without saying goodbye the, the second morning so anyway she comes back to town for reasons uh looking for her happiness kind of a thing like work feels off i want to make a change in my life but i don't know what i want to do where was the last place you were happy almost like people would meet on vacation which i'll be talking about shortly um so anyway i read that one and it was fine then the third book in this series don't remember the name of it is not was not immediately available at my library so that was unfortunate but i thought you know what i don't like i know who that book is about i know they're gonna get together i'm sure that i'm not missing like any other major plot things <laughs> so then i just read business casual um again bk borison and the fourth and final book in the series i will go back probably and read the third one i'm on hold for it at the library but yeah business casual for whatever reason the audiobook was available so i picked that up and read it and this is the one following nova and charlie nova is beckett's sister one of his sisters so beckett was the farmer from the second book his sister nova is a tattoo artist she's been pretty successful like living in the city i don't know it didn't it was on the East Coast somewhere. I feel like it was New York, but she didn't really talk about New York that much. But anyway, she's been successful, but she's starting up her own uh, tattoo shop. What do you call those? Studio? She's setting up her own studio in this small town, Inglewood, and trying to get that going. And that's her whole big thing is like needing it to be perfect because she feels like um, she has never worked hard and things have just come to her. And so she needs this to be perfect because it's the, it's like the thing that she has like really, really worked hard and fought for to do herself. Um, and then Charlie is our love interest here. And Charlie is, I don't even remember her name, Stella. He is the half brother of Stella, who is the Christmas tree farm owner that we followed in the first book. And I guess that they have had, like, he's always maybe, like, he always hits on her, but she's never really into it. There was, like, briefest of brief mentions of him in the second book, and then I don't really remember how many mentions of him were in the first book. Or not. Maybe there were more in the third book that I didn't read. But anyway, it was, like, an established, he hits on her a lot. She's not really into it. Or, or previously hasn't been. And at the... It starts off at the wedding uh, at Stella and Luca from the first book. It's, they're finally getting married and Nova is in a particular mood and asks Charlie to go home with her. And he's like really, really shocked and surprised and like doesn't really interpret it the right way initially either. And that makes Nova obviously understandably <laughs> a little embarrassed and upset, but they wind up talking about it afterwards and like, wind up deciding on like having casual hookups which is a setup that i want to see done like in a really steamy we can't like not even we can't help help ourselves way which was a little bit like not in love with but they were like trying not to go through that i want people who are like yeah let's just have fun uh, and when it doesn't work anymore, it doesn't work anymore. like i want that to be the feel and have it and have them like the more they spend time together realizing so this was closer to that than not in love it, it was closer to that steamy this is casual we'll see what happens charlie's only in town for like a month anyway and um, so that is like the very reasonable setup i liked that i will say that just like roma my biggest pet peeve with, with romance book with romance books is timeline and big feelings uh <sighs> <laughs> but um but overall I did really enjoy it I think I liked Nova and Charlie better as like characters and people it also then therefore was because like the whole thing is that they are hooking up uh it was a lot more steamy than in the weeds and I'm sure Love Light Farms as well I just don't really remember that far back I really did like it. I just overall feel like these books are just fine. The small town is really cute. The small town elements to this were really cute. A little bit unbelievable, but very, very cute. If you like like Gilmore Girls-esque small towns where everybody knows everybody, there's like a phone tree, it's, it's hilarious. So that is <laughs> the Love Light books that I read. And then when I ran out of those books, that's when I started doing the available now audiobook romance filter on Libby and just like scrolling until something looked right nothing did but then people we meet on vacation was available which is a book that I have read before I own a physical copy 
Um, but I just thought, you know what, actually maybe like a reread of that is like a good nothing, just something to have on in the background where like no stakes because I already know what happens. I do really like People We Made On Vacation. It is so close to being perfect, except for how weird that conflict is at the end at the airport how she just like poppy just like word vomits and totally screws everything up for no reason also they should have already had this conversation you don't know if if you've read the book you know what i'm ranting about and then this like whiplash weird season scene in the bar at the end is just like so unnecessarily <laughs> a weird fake out. I, I don't get it. It's just like one of the weirder endings for an otherwise really great book. This is the one where two best friends, Poppy and Alex, every summer they met in you know, like in college and university, whatever, we're in the States college, and they wind up taking a summer trip, a summer vacation together every single year. It's a big thing that they do together, even when their lives start drifting like geographically further apart and the complicatedness of having a, a opposite sex best friend when you are start seeing other people. The best part of this book is the flashbacks. So we're going back of like summer by summer, alternating with this like the current summer trip, which they haven't done in a couple years because something bad happened and they started, they stopped talking to vacations ago. They're doing a summer trip in the present timeline chapters. And then we go back chapter by chapter and see their relationship develop. And that like those chapters are like the best thing ever. They're my favorite. I wish they were longer. I do like Beach Read better. Beach Read is still my favorite. There's a lot. Oh, I meant to look it up. Let me grab my book. Because there's a quote in here. There's a lot about Poppy. She's not super likable in some regards, but there is a lot that she's going through that feels so relatable and very real. Even like all the stuff with like her family is just, it's so real. Um, and it's not dramatic in any way. And it's not relatable to me personally, but it feels so relatable because it just feels very like tangibly real. Like, yes, I can see that being a thing. But there was a quote that I felt like particularly relatable and I'm gonna find it, I wanna share it with you. Okay, I found it. So just to set the scene, this is not spoilery. Poppy found something out about Alex's past that she didn't realize. And she feels upset at herself with this thing. And so she, he said like, did I do something? He asks, I shake my head, grab the quad and swab, like whatever. I know I need to say something, but I don't want to cry because if I cry, this becomes about me. And the whole point of it is lost. Uh, it got me, that that got me for sure. So, so that was relatable. I hate this ending more than the cringy driveway music playing scene in Beach Read. That was just like, ah, it's not my preference. This was like, oh, why did you do this to me? It's so unnecessary. <laughs> and then I finished that last night, maybe like on my way to work. So then I had nothing to listen to. This is how bad like my like mental state of being is right now when I cannot, there's like huge magpies on my balcony. They're ginormous. This is how bad my like mental state of being is right now where I like cannot have like silence. I didn't feel like music. I didn't feel like a podcast. I don't really have, I'm not a big podcast person. I just wanted an audiobook to listen to like biking home from work. <laughs> so I was literally biking like, scrolling the available now like at red lights trying to find something to listen to and i wound up listening to under one roof by ali hazelwood which fortunately was a novella one of the like stem steminist whatever series uh novellas that she has as well so it was kind of perfect that it was only a novella because like i really didn't need to be picking up a new audiobook especially one that was like as random as that after having listened to three other brand totally random contemporary romances this follows Mara and Liam, who for weird reasons co-own a house. Um, but they obviously are like physically attracted to each other right out of the gate, but then they hate each other. And she's an environmentalist scientist. She's an environmental engineer. And he works as a lawyer who works for 
oil and gas. And so she thinks he's like the devil. And yeah, that's the setup. And obviously it's a, it's a romance novella. So you know where it goes. I, romance novellas are not for me, let's say. There's just like not enough time for me to buy in. But this was fine. This was totally fine. It was very Allie Hazelwood in our her hero and heroine in their personalities, in their physical appearances, <laughs> which is like a little bit waifish, a little bit clumsy, very can't see themselves as being attractive and likable, and then like really, really big <laughs> guy <laughs> who's big in all of the ways, of course. And it's usually he falls first, let's say. Anyway, yeah, that's that's the setup. It was fine. It's a romance novella. That's where I'm at. Okay, currently reading. I'm reading Iron Widow. I have been reading Iron Widow for quite a while now. I really enjoyed the first half. I was so on board with this and it's just gone in a very interesting direction that I was not expecting and I feel like I've been saying that a lot lately and I've, when I say it, I say it as like a negative. One would hope that you can't guess everything about a, about a book at, at the beginning. That's nice to not to not know everything that's going to happen but it's just taken a weird turn for me and again, it's a young adult. I'm struggling with the amount of world building that's happening. Our main character is not likable. I am okay with unlikable characters. She's making more unlikable choices for me sometimes. Or like, she's just all over the place. I just feel like she's all over the place. We'll see. We'll see what I feel when I finally finish it. But that's the only other thing that I have on the go right now. I, I'm okay. Technically, I'm still reading The Legacy of the Bright Wash. This is my physical book read and I just have not, I have not been doing that. I've been struggle busting on that for sure. And then coming up next, Dreams of Sorrow, the other novella in the Gale Song series. I am also getting a copy of shortly. I think it's available soon. It is also the ebook and not the audiobook, which unfortunate, which is unfortunate. And this is Gale Song 2.5. So you do have to read the first two books in the series in order to pick up this novella. I guess you don't have to, but there's a reveal regarding the character that this follows, which is technically the character that's introduced in book one. But so we get some information about them in book and like a very, very minor character. But there's a bit of a reveal in book two that makes it clear that this character has a very interesting backstory. And I am pretty sure that book 2.5 or this novella 2.5 is giving us that backstory. So I'm very excited for this one. Otherwise, there's like nothing really exciting coming up soon on my Library holds the audiobook for God Killer should be coming soon, so I will try to restrain myself and not pick up anything else audiobook wise until that until I get that copy, so that I can actually like read something that is at least on a TBR of some sort, <laughs> not just like random contemporary romances. I will follow up in a couple days or whenever, and see you then. New filming location. I feel like you never see this side of the room and that's because it's usually not attractive. <laughs> um, but we just got this new, new to us used shelf um, that I'm really, really vibing with. We, I have to get, or we have to like replace the little knobby thingies. And also the lighting was better in here this morning compared to in my bedroom. So we're going for it. I did finish two things by the end of the month, so I'm just gonna tell you about them now. Uh, I did read another one of those Allie Hazelwood novellas, the feminist ones. I read the second one, Stuck With You. This one was following Sadie, who is living in New York City, and she's working for like an environmental company as well. She has a one night stand, like a fabulous, amazing one night stand with this guy, I think his name was Eric. It goes amazing. However, the next day she finds out that his engineering company has like scooped one of her clients with essentially the same plan that she had just pitched to that client, but for cheaper because the company is bigger and can yeah, do better pricing. And then in the present time, she gets stuck in an elevator with this guy when the power goes out. My overall take of this one was, I didn't really get the appeal of this guy um, he was really weird. Like he, he actually turned out to be quite sweet and, you know, caring and whatever in, in certain moments. But when they're first, like when they do like their like mute, meet cute and that first conversation that like turns into the date that like turns into an evening date, like the same day that they meet, I, I didn't, 
I didn't see that the dialogue of like what he was saying was attractive or was something that would be enticing to this character, Sadie. Second pet peeve here is that they made the main character, and this is like a very particular pet peeve to me because I happen to live in Denmark, but Danish accents in terms of like a Dane speaking English is extremely hard to replicate. The auto narrator was supposed to be doing like the guy's supposed to be Danish. She just did sort of a British thing. She, so that wasn't right. And in fact, like any movie with a, with a Danish person, they're either have a British accent or German. Just watch The Prince and I. Everybody's British for some reason, except for his mom, who's very obviously German. And also, he had grown up in the US. He's, I think he made a thing like, oh, his brothers, you know, lost their accents, but he never quite did. False. I can confirm from having spoken to Danes who have spent like a single year living abroad somewhere else in a native English speaking place, whether that is England, um, the US, Australia, whatever, when you are spending their formative English learning years in a different country that speaks English, they pick up that accent. I have met Danes who spent a single year or like eight months when they were like teens in Australia who sounded Australian. I asked her when she moved here or from South Africa, they did not sound Danish. They sounded South African. So a, a Dane who moved to the US at like 14 or 15 would sound American when they spoke English. So that's like just like another like really, really particular pet peeve that is like so unimportant, but just like I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. There was a weird joke about him not liking ice cream and how undanish that was of him. And I just like, I don't get it. It's not cold here. This isn't Sweden or Norway, like common misconception. The geography and temperatures are very different here than they are in Sweden or Norway. It's so I just didn't, I didn't get that at all. And he like confirmed it, but like, yes, my brothers say the same thing. No, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not a good, that's not a good joke. This actually is like a huge pet peeve that I have because Christina Lauren books always make some of their characters have like Danish heritage because obviously one of them has Danish heritage and they get a lot of stuff wrong. So it's like a, it's like a pre-existing pet peeve of mine. Then I finished Iron Widow and this is a book that I have such mixed feelings on as well because it is kind of crazy. I am pretty sure that this is the final YA book that I had on my like YA books that I am planning to try because I hear good things. I think it's safe to say like without not, not being certain that I remember exactly which ones were on that list but I'm pretty sure that I have not been in love with any of them. So Iron Widow is set in a futuristic like mech a Chinese inspired world where we are following a main character <clears throat> oh, where they uh, like live kind of constantly being harassed by these large what they call them hunduns or something um, and like invaders who have taken have come like dropped into this world and taken over the world and they're losing lots and lots of land to these almost machine like beings that they then, when they kill, turn into these big mech suits. They're powered by two people, uh, a man and a woman, and usually the woman is essentially like drained of her chi because the man is the one like powering and piloting these mech suits. And he like uses his own chi, but then also he like drains his, what they actually call them like concubines. And our main character has a sister who went off to be a pilot's concubine and was in fact killed. So our main character decides that she's going to sign up to be one of these concubines as well. And she's going to infiltrate the system and kill the pilot who killed her sister. This book is just like the epitome of female rage. Our main character is just like that angry, raging woman who is wants to just light things on fire. Like the system is broken, burn it up. She is a little bit unlikable. She made a lot of decisions that were perhaps you understand why she's making the decisions, but they also feel really extreme. She just is like a bit of a loose cannon in a understandable way. Like I am totally upset about all the things that she's upset about. She just is like wild. Ah, uh, yeah. The plot raced. It is just like 
bananas fast paced as the plot like ricochets based on her wild choices she feels a little bit unhinged unhinged is perhaps the right word it's like her brain is just like ping-ponging from angry thought to angry thought and with like no working through of what should i do about this just like she does whatever first comes to mind in just like really dramatic fashion. That's at least how I felt about it. I can see that this would be really empowering for people in certain, with like certain histories, with in certain situations. This like brought back to mind, brought back to mind. I often don't think about the horrors of female mutilation in various ways. And this had a, a part where it focused a lot or talked a lot about like the foot binding that is forced upon girls in this culture and it was just like horrifying and enraging and I remember talking to my partner like I I don't get it and like just like fuming and like frothing at like I was frothing at the mouth about like I don't get it that isn't to say that she doesn't always reflect upon that like at one point earlier on or at one point later on she reflects on how she was feeling earlier in the book about like society told me I could either do this like be this way or die and so I was so willing to die because I didn't want to do this and now actually I don't need to die because I've realized I don't have to be one or the other based on there so like yes I, I loved that that was actually acknowledged because it was a really big jump from like I'm gonna do this thing that's absolutely gonna lead to my death and probably the death of like certain people around me but it'll be like but I will you know take a bunch of people down with me who deserve it to then like really really fighting for her life and I was like I don't know how to get it and so then I actually they had that conversation I appreciated that but just I don't know I feel like I was like halfway maybe a third of the way through this book I was so in love and then as the plot got more and more wild it lost me a little bit they didn't make me care about the at-large world problem that was happening I did have a sense about what was what that problem what the root of that problem was I have seen similar things before they didn't make me care enough about the problem early on enough for it to be a big thing when we got there. I don't know. I'm pretty sure this is a duology. I don't know if I'll pick up the second one. I feel really, really neutral about continuing on. So there we have it. Those are all the books that I read this year. I don't have a tally in my head. Two, seven, eight, nine, maybe? I think I read nine books. Nine is a bigger number than what I have been reading lately, but that's because these are not standard books for me. I know that I said that I wasn't going to pick up another audiobook until God Killer, but then I realized that because of like when I had postponed God Killer 2, I wasn't going to get the audio until already a little bit into October. So I was scrolling again on the available now romance like romance list and oddly because it's not actually a romance, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow came up um, by Gabriella Zevin, something like that. And this is a book that I have taken it from the library a couple times and just like never picked it up. It was a huge sensation the year that it came out, which was maybe 2022. And I really wanted to read it. And so I have been listening to it and I love it. I can't wait to tell you about it in my October wrap up. I'm actually quite far into it. <laughs> I will say that it is giving me a very interesting new appreciation for gaming at large, which is not something that I like really have ever thought about or cared about. So I am I'm really, really love that new perspective that I'm getting. I'm also currently reading Legacy of the Brightwash. I have picked this back up again and I'm trying to prioritize and focus on it again. So continuing to read at least like one chapter a night. So I was able to read physically last night in bed and I hope to continue to do so. The baby's sleep has been like really, really bad the last little bit. So I have not been able to focus on that, but I think that it is improving. Last night was good. Let's hope it's like an upswing. So I will, I am going to prioritize and keep taking that away, or keep taking away at that again. And I have also recently taken out the Trader of Baru Corm Cormorant. Baru Cormorant, maybe is how I hear people pronounce it um, as well. And this is a take down the empire from the inside kind of story where the main character is doing so by financial and economic insight and power within this world. So they're taking the, it's like a really interesting 
and novel approach to like the destruction of an empire, like a revenge takedown from the inside. But I am really excited to be able to finally read this book. I've had it on my eye forever. And I'm just like situations with my library hold situation and my library um, have led me to take that book out right now <laughs> uh, without getting into it. My library just cut the amount of holds that they normally give you by half. So it used to be 30 that you could have 30 books on hold at any given time. And they just out of the blue cut it to 15 with no warning whatsoever. I have feelings about that. But anyway, let's leave it with that for today. Let me know how your September was. Is it already like very, very fall feeling where you are? Or perhaps you're in the Southern hemisphere and you're like, no, it is spring right now and, and lovely. Let me know. I will see you guys in my next video. Have